Would you bow your heads as I read Psalm 119, verses 174 through 176. The word says, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let me live that I may praise you and may your law sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your command. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray together this morning. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us lift up our voices. Let us pray unified in the Holy Spirit. May we be unified and pray for the service and pray for each other and repent of our sins that we may please God. Would you humble yourself with me right now as I lead us in prayer? Let us pray in Jesus' name. Mighty God, we know that you are the creator. You are the one and only God, Lord. Yes, you are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord, you are holy and righteous. And we are sinners, Lord. We have failed you. We are rebellious, Lord, and we are weak. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy and forgive us. We claim the blood of Jesus, for we know that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, the Holy One of God. And we know you died, Lord Jesus, for us. A terrible death. But you were raised in power. You were raised in the Holy Spirit. And you are with us today. Help us, Lord, to put away the world and glorify you. Draw near to you in all that we say and do. May it be sincere and from our hearts. For you are God Almighty. Hallelujah. 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 Father, thank you. Thank you for every soul, every family represented, Lord, that participates in this service today. May, Lord, we be pleasing to you. We know we are weak, Lord. That's why we ask for your spirit to lead us and guide us in our worship. We ask, Lord, that, Lord, you would be pleased and receive the glory. Lord, the world tugs at our hearts and at our minds. Help us to put away and not think about yesterday or even later today or tomorrow, but to give this time to you. After all, Lord, you're the one that gave us this time. And let us remember how good you are. And let us praise you from our hearts. Let us draw near to you, for you are God Almighty. And we are your people, and it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning we're going to sing, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the royal cross He suffered from the curse to set me free, I sing, I'll sing of my Redeemer, who with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he filled my pardon, I paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In his boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely gave A thing of sing of my Redeemer For with his blood he purchased me on the cross, he still my pardon, I paid the debt and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, his triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory he giveth. Over sin and death and hell, I sing, I'll sing of my Redeemer, 
for with his blood he purchased me on the cross he filled my pardon I paid the debt and made me free I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me he from death to life have brought me Son of God with him to be a thing of sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he filled my pardon I paid the debt and set me free amen my life is in you my life is in you the lord my strength is in you the lord my hope is in you the lord it's in you it's in you my life is in you the lord my strength is in you the lord my hope is in you the lord it's in you in you I will praise you with all of my life I will praise you with all of my strength with all of my life with all of my strength all of my hope is in you. My life is in you, O Lord, my strength. Is in you, O Lord, my hope. Is in you, O Lord, it's in you, it's in you. My life is in you, O Lord, my strength. <coughs> My hope is in you, the Lord, it's in you, it's in you. I will praise you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life with all of my strength all of my hope is in you my life is in you the lord my strength is in you the lord my hope is in you the lord it's in you it's in you my life is in you, O Lord, my strength. Is in you, O Lord, my hope. Is in you, O Lord, it's in you. It's in you. It's in you. Amen.
everyone please stand with me. I ask you to stand with me and please repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're taking your seats, turn with me to the book of Zechariah. We're continuing through the book here. We're getting close to the end. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. That's Zechariah 12, 1 through 9. Sister Wazel will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Wazel, please. 하나님께 주신 오늘의 말씀, 스가라 12장 1절에서 9절입니다. 이스라엘의 가난 여호와의 경고의 말씀이라 여호와 고 하늘을 펴시며 땅의 틀을 세우시며 사람 안에 심령을 지으시니가 이르시되 보라 내가 예루살렘으로 그 사면 모든 민족에게 취하게 하는 자니 되게 할 것이라 예루살렘이 에오사일 때에 유다에까지 이르리라 그 날에는 내가 예루살렘을 모든 민족에게 무거운 돌이 되게 하리니 그것을 드는 모든 자는 크게 상할 것이라 천하 만국이 그것을 치르고 물리라 여호와가 말하노라 그날에 내가 모든 말을 쳐서 놀라게 하며 그 단자를 쳐서 미치게 하되 유자 족속은 내가 돌보고 모든 민족의 말을 쳐서 눈이 멀게 하리니 유다의 우두머리들이 마음속에 이르기를 예루살렘 주민이 그들의 하나님 만군의 여호와로 말미암아 힘 얻었다 할지리라 그날에 내가 유다 지도자들을 나무 가운데 하루 같게 하며 곡식단 사이에 햇불 같게 하리니 그들이 그 좌우에 에워싼 모든 민족들을 부살을 것이요 예루살렘 사람들은 다시 그본곳 예루살렘에 살게 되리라 여호와가 먼저 유다 장망을 구원하리니 이는 다윗의 집의 영광과 예루살렘 주민의 영광이 유다보다 더하지 못하게 하려니라 그날에 여호와가 예루살렘 주민을 보호하리니 그 중에 약한 자가 그날에는 다이 같겠고 다이세 족석을 하나님 같고 무리 앞에 있는 여호와의 사자 같을 것이라 예루살렘을 치러 오는 이방 사람들을 그날에 내가 멸하기를 힘쓰리라. 아멘. 아멘. Zechariah chapter 12 verses 1 through 9. An oracle. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man with him, him, within him, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends out all the surrounding people reeling. Judah 
will be sieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, The people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. They will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. The Lord will save the dwelling, dwellings of Judah first so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day... I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for this message. And I thank you for the people to receive it. May we all have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. And may your good and perfect will be accomplished, Lord, as we draw near to you through this message. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and being our God. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Jerusalem, a rock. Today we come to the second part of the last section of the book of Zechariah. That is chapters 12 through 14. Most Bible scholars regard this section as a parallel to the preceding section because of the similar pronouncement, if you will, because the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And back in Zechariah 9.1, it says the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach. The similarity for both oracles indicate upon whom the burden will be laid upon the land of Hadrach and upon Israel. Chapters 9 through 11 basically deal with events concerning Christ's first coming and chapters 12 through 14 deal with the period involving his second advent or his return to defeat the enemies of his people and establish his earthly kingdom during the millennium. Today, our text describes Jerusalem being besieged, if you will, for destruction by the nation. Yet God keeps her safe. He keeps Israel safe through the, even through this very dangerous situation. And in the end times, the allied armies of the anti-Christian world, those powers, will besiege Jerusalem. The repeated use of the term on that day seems to synchronize the event with the what back in uh, the uh, Jeremiah, or the, it was the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, and in Daniel, Daniel 12, it is a time of trouble there also. It synchronizes with those. And although it, it's a time of unspeakable anguish and trouble for Israel, it's, it's really the climax of their sufferings and their tribulations down through the centuries. And Yahweh will strengthen them during this time of great need. And Israel will turn to him. Israel will turn to him and he will keep them safe and be saved because they place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So let's consider our scripture today. First, the immovable rock. Verse 1 tells us 
that this oracle of God is to fall upon the nation of Israel. It says a prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person declares. Now the second oracle here emphasizes that it is the message of the creator and the sustainer and his authority. The statement of divine authority is portrayed by three participles. I hope you caught that. It's really three participles of God's genius, his creative power. The first, he is who stretches out the heaven. The phrase shows that his omnipotent way uh, of over the universe, over the universe and the ease which he lays everything out. He lays out everything that we can see, just like a tablecloth is laid out. Everything we see, God just lays it out. He has that kind of power. He stretches out the heavens. Second, he lays the foundation of the earth, and he demonstrates that he has absolute control over the earthly realm. The marvel is that he hung planets in space, and it causes really ceaseless wonder and praise to those who consider it. Now, physics and scientists, they may attempt an explanation of the heavens. They have many theories, but actually laying them out in their particular order is another thing completely. How did they happen to be in the order that they're in? God could only do that. The third one is he forms the spirit of man within him. Now, the word forms here in, implies a careful shaping that's done by a potter. When you form the potter, uh, makes things out of clay. Science cannot, can only guess at the spirit of man. Science has no idea about my spirit or your spirit. But God forms this delicate, life-giving spark that animates my body of clay. If I didn't have a spirit, all I had was this body of clay, I wouldn't be alive. It's the spirit that makes me alive. When my spirit leaves me, you will say that I'm dead because my clay pot will return to the dust, to the dirt that it came from. But what keeps me alive now is my spirit. And guess what? Science can't figure that part out. They've tried and they're still trying, but how can I be alive? Only by the Spirit. The word within here shows that the individual, his very makeup and his functioning are very important to God. Our Lord is not just a God who who creates universe and then says, okay, take care of yourself, work it out, you'll be fine. No, if we look above, you know what? We see God, what God has created. We go out here, God created the materials for all this. We go outside, God created the sky and the heavens and the earth and everything around us. We look down, we see the earth that he founded. Everything around us is created by God, the God of creation. And if we look within us, what do we see? We see a spirit that God has formed in us. That's how Adam and Eve were made alive, is God breathed life into them, his spirit into them. The God of creation is a God who cares for us. And all three of these participles, they indicate continuous acts going on more and more, even today in the present. Were, were God, if God was to stop, would stop sustaining creation, if he was to turn his back just for a few minutes, just then everything would be nothing. God's what keeps us going. God is able to perform what he predicts. And having established here God's supremacy, the prophet goes on in verse 2 to look at other mighty works that God will perform that will also challenge the man's 
small faith. Our faith is very small. He says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling, and Judah will be, be dis, besieged as well as Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is mentioned 52 times in Zechariah, and 22 times of those occur in the last three chapters. To describe Jerusalem's situation, she is first likened to a bowl that's filled with judgment. The nations plan to swallow her up, but instead of draining it and taking it all out, they will reel because of it. Reeling is really uh, from the root word to quiver or to shake or to stagger, like someone drunken and has no control. All who attempt to drink this cup will be sent reeling, staggering, falling. The coveted prize of Jerusalem will cause people to besiege it and become intoxicated by the pleasure of trying to seize it. That's what's going to happen. But taking hold of this cup will actually cause them to become helpless and powerless. In verse 3, the image of weighty stone is used to describe Jerusalem as God declares what he will do. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. Now this imagery here moves beyond them reeling to be suffering like a self-inflicted injury. You know, a stone of burden is a very heavy stone. It's hard to lift. It's a stone that's like it's embedded in a field which is in the way. Any of you who've done any plowing out in the fields, uh, uh, maybe a new field, when you come up on a rock, it doesn't have to be very big, but let's say it's as big as your head or a little bigger. And when you try to move it, it's hard because it's in that dirt. And you've got to dig and hard, and once you get it out of there, it's still heavy. I don't know why that is the case, but it's heavy. This stone cuts and wounds those who attempt to move it. Jerusalem is compared to this heavy, immovable rock that the nations attempt to move, but they only hurt themselves in the process. Now, stress is on the seriousness here of the injury. This is not a little cut. The root here is usually associated with a gash or a deep cut, cutting of oneself. But here the idea seems rather of rupturing themselves or, or actually dislocating their backs when they try to lift it. Some of you have experienced some dislocated backs and you've had some problems because you're trying to lift something. The task of moving Jerusalem out of their way proves to be too great for the nation. And we will find that this occurs because of divine intervention and God's protection. All the nations of the earth will be confused as what to do about the problem of Jerusalem. We're seeing that fulfilled today, are we not? We see that being fulfilled even as we live. Part two is that those who come against Jerusalem will be destroyed. History reveals something. We don't even have to talk about the Bible. Let's go to history that we know it. History reveals that every nation that has ever tried to destroy the Jews has what? Itself, it has been destroyed. The Jews are still here. They may be all over the world, but they're still here. And look how many times different nations and different people have tried to destroy them. If it were the same when the nation's collective attacked God's chosen people, it's going to be the same way. The tiny land of Israel is an amazing fact, and it really can only be explained that it even exists and that it's there is because God wants it to be, and it's in biblical terms. It began almost 4,000 years ago with the family of Jacob or Israel and his 12 sons. 
most of the contemporary nations at that time, at the same time that they started Israel and Jerusalem, there was a country called Elam. There was a Chaldean. There was the Hittite Empire. There were many others, and guess where they are today? Find them. They don't exist. They've been destroyed. But Israel's still there. But today, Israel is alive and is in fact the very hub of international concern. All nations now are looking at Israel. Why? Because God. Because of God. You see, God has prophesied that Jerusalem is going to be an immovable rock. An immovable rock. You know, the whole Muslim world insists that Israel should be destroyed as a nation. But Israel is determined to maintain her present boundaries. For 1,800 years, the wandering Jew has a true home, and yet no really real true home, and yet somehow they survive. The city of Jerusalem itself, just since the time of Jesus now, we won't go back past that, just since the time of Jesus, has been controlled by so many other countries, like the Romans, the Syrians, the Arabs, the Crusaders, the Egyptians, oh, the Persians, oh yeah, the Turks too. They have all these different people, all these different nations have been in control of Jerusalem. But never again has the Jews come back and controlled Israel until our generation. Until now. The problem of Israel and Jerusalem is apparently unmanageable to other nations of the world, so it must be ha fixed. It must be resolved by the only person who can, and that is God. God can resolve the situation. Zechariah 12 shows that it will be solved when? On that day, the day when Jesus returns. That's when it will be resolved. At that time, he says in Zechariah 12, 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me, the only the one that they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Ooh. I jumped ahead, didn't I? Sorry about that. I just got excited because we'll talk more about that later. But Paul says in Romans 11, 25 through 27, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, deliverer, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob and in this covenant with them when I take away their sins. Hallelujah. You see, back in Zechariah 12, 3, notice that all the nations, all the nations are gathered there. All the nations will be represented in the armies that will be gathered against Jerusalem. Revelation 16, if you want to read it, 13 through 15, indicates that the spirits of devils will be working miracles and they will gather this army there against Jerusalem, against Israel. So then the second thing we need to look at is panicked and blind horses. Verse 4 speaks of the great future battle against Jerusalem. Most likely part of the battle of the battle of Armageddon. I'm sure you've heard of it, the last great battle on earth. On that day I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Again, on that day. It's a phrase that echoes 14 times through the chapters of 12 through 14, and it's a phrase that occurs 16 times in the final chapters of Zechariah. 
It gives cohesion to the timing of all the events that's being described here. They all belong to that time which was future to the prophet. It's a time when the Lord's purpose for his people would be brought to the end. In other words, what God wants is going to happen that time. Frutration. It points to that new age and has beginning in Christ, which stretches forward to the consummation of his return. And at that time during the tribulation, the people of God on earth will experience the fury of the devil. You know why the devil's going to be upset and trying to hurt God's people even more then? Because he knows his time is short. So he's going to try to do all he can. But the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war they will be defeated by Jesus Christ. Satan will deceive the nations from the four corners of all the earth, and they will march to surround Jerusalem, but they will be divinely overthrown. Zechariah is presented here with glimpses of the destiny of God's people, and he relates them to his contemporaries so that they might believe and take courage. If they are on the Lord's side, they're on the side whose victory is assured, whose enemies will be utterly overthrown. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we must make sure we are on the Lord's side when this comes, because this time is coming. First, God struck the horses with panic. Now, this really refers to a startled, startled animal. Those of you who've rode horses and been around horses, you know what happens to horses, even one that's well-trained. If they're startled and something scares them, you can't control them. You can't. Next, God struck the riders with madness and wildness and insanity. The riders were smat, uh, smite, smitten, <laughs> actually smitten with madness, and they also lose control of themselves, and they act irrationally, and uh, ba basically they would turn on each other. They would turn on each other. And as the armies of the world converge there, there would be tremendous puzzlement. God will strike the enemy's strength with blindness. This increases, the, and their horses and their horsemen will be unable to follow the rules of discipline and training, their, their training goes out the window. Maddened riders mounted on blind and bewildered steeds. The only thing they're going to destroy is themselves. But God says that he will keep a watchful eye over Judah. Did you notice Judah being used there for the first time in a long time? Why did God say Judah? When well, Judah is a designation of the nation that followed the king who was in the lineage of David. Remember, Judah are the ones that stayed with the king that followed the king of the, of the lineage of David. This indicates that those who follow the true divinic king, and we know who he is, he's King Jesus, the Messiah. Those who follow the Messiah will be the Judah of that day. This binding of the enemy's forces and looking out for the house of Judah will bring about a melting of their hard and rebellious hearts in true repentance. In other words, they're going to realize that God is taking care of them. Verse eight, uh, 5 states that even outlying regions will recognize that they have been uniquely blessed and supported by God. It says, then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. The clans of Judah will determine that it is the Lord who is their strong help. When people of God are victorious, through God, it gives confidence to the rest of God's people because that makes them realize 
<laughs> we can depend on God too because he blessed them, he saved them. Praise the Lord, he can save us. It gives more confidence. Because God delivers. God will watch over his people and he will see that they are delivered. Verse 6 states that he will make the Jews like fire and their enemies like dry stubble. On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among sheaves. And they will consume all the surrounding peoples right and left, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. What a wonderful promise. You know, a fire pot is a vessel employed, uh, they used to carry it around so that you could ha start a fire. They did, you ever rub two sticks together? It's pretty hard. It's a lot easier to carry a little pot with some fire in it. They didn't have Bix in those days or cigarette lighters or, or anything. They didn't have that. So they carried their fire in a pot. And a good mass of hot coals under sticks of wood means the destruction of the wood. Secondly, to make the picture even more dramatic, a flaming torch among the sheaves is added. And a torch thrown among sheaves make the fate of the sheaves basically hopeless because it's just dry grass and it burns quickly. In spite of the battle raging though all around, our word, the prophecy here, says the people of Jerusalem can dwell in their homes because God is with them. This is a picture of what? It's a picture of security and confidence. The outlying areas that encounter the world's armies will also experience deliverance. First, as God remembers his servant David, as verse 7 indicates, says the Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. The picture here is of the people outside the city walls. They don't enjoy any protection, no dwellings. They, they didn't have the walls to protect themselves. Those who live inside of Jerusalem, they had at least a wall and a house, right? The ones who lived outside the wall, they're living in tents and nothing, and there's nothing to protect them, so they're more defenseless and exposed living in tents in an open country. But they are going to experience the salvation of God first. They're going to experience God's supernatural intervention first. And not only because they would be attacked before the city would be, but because the inhabitants of the more prestigious dwellings inside the, the, uh, inside the city, they wouldn't be too proud of themselves. Because they would say, well, I, we were saved because of the walls. We were saved because we're special. No, when they see even the people around them are living in the tents, they're going to know that it's God that's saving them, not them, right? For the totally defenseless, humble folks outside, they will be delivered first. And the deliverance will be so obviously brought on by God that nobody can boast and no glory for anybody, only glory can be given to God and to him alone instead of even partially to them cities uh, for themselves who live in the city because these guys live out in tents, out in the open, and God protected them first. Hallelujah. So my last main point, like King David, verse 8 states that not only will God defend them, the people of Jerusalem will be given special powers. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. Now, this is a gracious promise of God's assistance and deliverance to the Jewish remnant. This is for those who are in their heart of hearts, they have made God their strength. They realize that it takes God to get them through. No matter what happens, we need God 
even in this life, to help us go through the hard times. Again, the reoccurring phrase here is, on that day. This is an unusual day because it's a time of the great tribulation. The Lord will defend the inhabitants. Defend is to cover or surround or, or to shield or defend. And the Lord's intervention gives protection to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The Lord's defenses will be absolute safety. Nobody can, who can come against God? Nobody can. Not only will Yahweh defend them, but he will arm them, the remnant, with superhuman strength as we know it. They shall be as David, the great warrior and the victorious conqueror of the Israelite history. And David leaped over walls, he slew giants, he slew bears, you name it. King David was a mighty warrior, and those of the house of David will be like God. Elohim, that's what it says here. Be like God. God will be with them. He will go before them, and he will give them supernatural strength. And verse 9, in the end here, expresses the Lord's determination and gives his people a promise to rely on. When they see all things around them uh, seem hopeless, when things around us seem hopeless from our human standpoint, when we know there's no hope, there's nothing we can do, what do we do? We must turn to the Lord. He says, on that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. Again, the Lord dramatically here reverts back to the first person when he speaks of his destruction of Jerusalem's enemies. He says, I, I will set out to destroy. And it indicates that God will fight all the nations being represented in their armies that attack and by he's going to destroy their armies, their destruction. And those who oppose God's people will not prevail. They may be winning now. They may win some battles now. But in the end, God has the victory. The hold that the evil has on us right now, we know that we are held back by the enemy because the enemy, uh, many times, he, he, uh, he may not control us individually all the time, but he certainly does control things around us. And because of that, we have to live our lives differently than we really want to. Well, that's going to stop. Because that hold that evil has on humanity cannot be broken until there's a decisive end or conquest of the evil. When that evil is totally gone, hallelujah, then we can really be praising God and living in his shadow, living under his wing. That is what's going to happen. When God makes that happen, evil and pain and oppression will be ended, hallelujah. And that's on earth. Praise the Lord. In conclusion, please remember this. God will never forget his people. He'll never forget his promises. He is a God who is watching and causing events to help his people to come to him. He does so today, even in the church, by letting us face challenges that help us to realize we need him. If everything, we're sort of weak, aren't we? Everything's going perfectly and everything's good. We tend to forget that God's out there helping us. But when we're at our wit's end and we have no strength, there's nothing we can do. Who must we turn to? God. So he lets these things happen in our lives so that we know we should turn to him. Those who oppose God's people will not win forever. They may be hurting us now. You know, God's going to fight all the nations represented in their armies and attacked by their armies' destruction. 
Those who will come, uh, you know, God's just going to win, you know. He does so today for the church, and we discover his needs, and in the last days, God's going to give the Jews a dilemma so great that it will cause them all to turn to him as their only hope. And he, and he will receive this stiff-necked people with open arms. He's going to receive them with open arms. He receives any and all who call upon him through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. If you call upon Jesus from a sincere heart, there's nothing you have done, nothing you could have done that would keep God from receiving you as long as you call on him sincerely from your heart. Let us do it now as Judah will do then, and let us thank God now for his deliverance in all our times of trouble. Let us do it now from our hearts. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, oh, hallowed be thy name. For Lord God, you are God Almighty, creator of all the heavens and the earth, and we are mere humans who are sinners and weak, Lord. We need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. We need Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Help us, Lord, those of us that know you, Lord. Help us to draw nearer to you, to be more like you, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be humble before you. And, Lord, those that don't know Jesus, those who have not come to you, we especially lift them up to you, Lord. Please. Help them to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Help us to come to you and give you glory and honor and receive your love. For, Lord, you are a good God, and it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen.